Hi, my name is Sonia Madison and welcome to Law Unfiltered, where I talk about current events and some of the legal implications. Well, keeping on with our discussion of the Bill Cosby case, we did have two witnesses that were pretty important in, in determining whether or not he was going to be proved either guilty or innocent, or at least not guilty, I should say. And one was Andrea Constant. Now, some of you may remember, she's actually the reason why we're here. She's the one that's making the allegations that he, in fact, penetrated her with his finger and assaulted her. And as a result, she was unconscious. She wasn't given <coughs> any consent and she calls it, again, uh, an assault. So in her testimony, she starts by giving a little bit of background about herself, that she was part of the women's basketball program at Temple University and that's how she met Bill Cosby. She talks a lot about how they developed the friendship. They did start calling each other and then there were instances where they would meet each other for dinner, sometimes alone, sometimes with other people, as well as just other activities outside of just the, the university. And so the even but prior to the alleged incident in question, she talks about how there was at least one instance where he made suggestive touching or suggestive contact on her and she swatted off and immediately rejected him and said, hey, I'm not here for that. Well, subsequently is the assault. And when she goes in to talk about the assault, she says she was at his house to, I guess, vent about whether she wanted to leave the university because she desired to go back to school to be a massage therapist. And then subsequently, she was talking about how it was just causing her a lot of anxiety and Bill Cosby offered to give her some pills and he called them herbal medicines in order to help relax her. Well, she says instead of relaxing her, it tightened her body, she couldn't move her arms, she couldn't move her legs. And then the next thing she knows, he's behind her with his hand inside her as well as putting her hand on him in his inappropriate areas. So, of course, the cross-examination challenges not only the actual story, but as well as her overall relationship with Cosby before and after the alleged incident. So, essentially, they're saying, listen, before you had this friendship that was already kind of suggestive, considering that you're taking dinners with him, considering that you're alone with him, and even after he made this alleged suggestive contact, you still put yourself in, in a situation where it was not professional. And then subsequent to this alleged assault, you continue to talk to him. I think there was at least over 50 plus phone calls that um, was between the two. And I say at least 20 or so that was initiated by her. Um, they also talked about how you didn't report this until a year later. And so it, it really just tries to attack her credibility so that the jury can see maybe there's some doubt or maybe this isn't someone that you should take as what her story says is true. So. In addition to her testimony, there was a testimony of a detective, and that was pretty much the only witness that the defense brought out. And so the detective really spoke about, well, listen, this is why the, we didn't bring this charge back in 2005, because we weren't quite sure about the credibility of the witness, and we were still trying to determine if we felt she was credible or not. And so that was significant because, again, not only do you have the witness take the stand, and then you have the cross of the defense really challenging the accuracy of the story, but you have a third party who's a detective who's trained and at least supposed to be an expert in being able to evaluate whether or not someone is credible or whether or not a case should go to trial. And in this instance, he determined, well, I still don't have the substantial proof that we would need, at least, and that's, of course, the beyond reasonable, reasonable element to make sure that we can put this case going forward. And so again, what the defense is showing is there is doubt, he had doubt, so it is definitely reasonable that you guys should also see doubt in this case. And so with that, we, we get to the verdict, and of course, as you guys know by now, it was declared a mistrial. There were two people that just refused to believe that the prosecution put on enough evidence to show beyond a reasonable doubt that Cosby did in fact sexually assault or committed some type of crime against her involving assault. So here are some, at least some lessons going forward. I think one of the things that really tripped up the witness and really tripped up the effect of this case is the fact that when you don't put yourself in a position to be as credible as you can or to, to avoid any type of insinuations or innuendos, then that creeps in that doubt. So for example, when you're having dinners with someone one-on-one, -on -one, that tends to be more personal and less professional. When you're continuing to make contact with someone after 
they allegedly assaulted you or even raped you, that tends to suggest that either you didn't consider it that because a lot of people feel, and these are 12 jurors, right? They feel if you were violated in that extreme way that you're not going to want to continue to have contact with this person, that you're going to want to immediately notify authorities that you're going to feel some kind of shame or some type of even fault them in yourself and here but they weren't seeing that they were seeing someone that continued to put herself in a situation where a it could happen again or b it was consensual and it would happen again under a consensual element now on the flip side now i'm not saying cosby is completely blameless because again it does tarnish your reputation when you are facing charges or put on the stand or tried in this manner and so even as something that he should consider going forward. When you become a public figure, of course everything is magnified, but using drugs to either taint someone's consciousness or to impair them in any way, it's just a dangerous line and, and it's something that really shouldn't be done. I mean, consent really has to be conscious, it really has to be aware, and when you do things like that, again, you just put yourself in a situation where people then doubt even your credibility. Now, in this instance, he didn't take the stand, which I thought was extremely wise of him because, obviously, as we saw back in 2005 when he took a deposition, it definitely hurt him more than it helped him. But um, he is probably going to face other charges out in other states. And so we will see if other judges are going to be more lenient in terms of, hey, we won't let 50 other women come in and talk about it because in this, in this case, the judge did bar several other women from being able to take the stand to vouch for his pattern of practice, as well as, okay, is someone else going to be less credible or is someone else going to have more inconsistencies? Unlike this person, she did have a lot of inconsistencies. She did talk about how, well, this allegedly happened in 1990. The first woman's witness said it happened in 1990. Then she said it happened in 1996. And then she said it happened in 1991. I mean, when you're talking about something so far back, it's definitely easier to place holes in the story. So let me know what you guys think. Are you surprised that it was a hung jury or did you expect that? Or are you anticipating it happening again in another case and perhaps he being found guilty? Let me know and thanks so much for tuning in. I'll catch you next time on Law Filtered.